I should behave as a man. And of course, Berlin in those days, uh, kissing a woman on the lips, at, at being a woman, was an acceptable way of life. So it was a bit, not a, a shocking gesture at all, as far as the German Dietrich was concerned. And of course, she was always very, very critical about the Americans being so, these terrible, terrible Puritans, you know. <laughs> so this she did to shock and waited for Joe to buckle under the studio heads who said it had to go, which of course they did, and he didn't buckle. Their partnership continued with the spy story, Dishonored, and then their most popular movie, Shanghai Express. Shanghai Express was set in a mythical China, as imagined by von Sternberg and created with his camera. Sternberg always worked with excellent cinematographers. Uh, you know, on the list are Hal Rawson and, and Lee Garms and Burt Glennon and later on Lucian Ballard. And I think there's argument to this day as to, you know, who should take credit for what. Some cinematographers feel that Sternberg was given credit for things that, that really belonged to, to his cinematographers. But I don't think any, anyone argues that, that for sheer knowledge of, of his star, of Dietrich, of her face, of her mystique, uh, he definitely was the master. And I mean, in film after film, you see this, his ability to just surround her with atmosphere and, you know, foreground, background, you're in a place and yet your eye will go to her. But it, it, it was, whether it was Morocco or Shanghai or whatever, he will put her in a place that, that lends her a mystery that is just exactly the essence of why she became a star. And he certainly knew how to bring out the best in this woman. She would create a costume that technically, photographically, was impossible to put on film. And she did it on purpose because she believed that he was capable of everything and anything. It was her utter, she never questioned his talent and he never questioned her ability to invent even more invent Dietrich, then re-embellish Dietrich, then reinvent Dietrich. This was her job. And being a good German that she was, that was her duty. You were always polite, Doc. You haven't changed a bit. You have, Madeline. You've changed a lot. Have I lost my looks? No, you're more beautiful than ever. How have I changed? I don't know. I wish I could describe it. Well, Doc, I've changed my name. Married? No. It took more than one man to change my name to Shanghai Lily. So you're Shanghai Lily. The notorious white flower of China. You heard of me. And you always believed what you heard. The stuff is peculiar, it's, uh, but visually, visually, it works every time, if you look at it really as a silent film, um, which I don't mean to say the dialogue isn't good or, or the acting isn't good, but it, it's stylized. It's all very stylized, everything he did. And if you look at it by the conventions of today, you know, modern kind of movie making, it'll seem different and strange, but it was strange then, you know, wasn't it? I think this sequence in uh, Shanghai Express evokes something of, of somebody who knew the language of the silent film. Um, once this dialogue scene is finished, you, you see that we're having a star moment. And it's the kind of thing they love to put in where you basically have a chance to just uh, have your, your actress by herself in a beautiful light for a moment that registers with the audience of the, this, this image. And I love this. She comes in to this railway carriage and she'll uh, shut off the light. And what the light is supposed to be hitting her uh, in the train. Is it moonlight coming through something in the train? We don't know. We really don't care. We just know we're seeing uh, Marlene Dietrich in this beautiful light. And this is the moment, this is the kind of thing that Sternberg specialized in with her, this light 
placed extremely high, coming down, and her face tilted up to, to uh, look up into it, to give that light in the, uh, the highlight in the eye, and this emotional moment where her hand trembles with a cigarette. This is the type of thing that, that made movie stars movie stars. Put your camera over here, will you? You don't want to look through it, do you? No. I'll put a two-inch lens on here. In November 1966, a few years before his death, von Sternberg made a rare visit to London. Here, he agreed to give Kevin Brownlow a demonstration of his lighting technique for the BBC series The Movies. This took place at a small studio in Isleworth. When we arrived at... Isleworth Studios, where we are now. The BBC crew were ready for us. They were relaxed, drinking coffee the way that t technicians usually are. The moment Sternberg stepped into the room, the temperature dropped, and people realized that they had to do what was ordered instantly. And Sternberg inspired uh, a kind of fear from some of the technicians, certainly me. I was just watching. Move that, uh, move that clock on the mantelpiece to the left, will you? More. Hold it. I thought that uh, Alison Gordon, who was the girl that played the model, uh, had the sort of bone structure that uh, Sternberg could light very effectively. Oh. <coughs> would you raise it up? And see if you can cut across her forehead. Across the forehead. That light is not on her head. That light is on her shoulders and put, right. put it up on her head. Now put it on her. On her. Shoulder. Huh? Shoulder. He was being put on the spot to produce the Sternberg look. And it was fascinating to see, uh, with relatively simple resources, how he went about it. Do you want to know what I want it for? Uh, yeah, which lamp on it? Huh? Which lamp? Which size lamp? Well, get a gauze down here. You don't want to know what I want it for. <coughs> I'm difficult, if that phrase is correct, in uh, demanding an, an absolute silence while I work. And this is not strange, because if you write, or if you paint, or if you sculpt, you, you have a closed door, you have some place where someone may knock to ask permission to enter. But in the case of a director who has a much more difficult job to do, he, he's got a thousand people around him who always come in and out and make nuisance of themselves. And uh, he has a thousand problems to take care of and must work, work, work from early in the morning to late at night, day after day, to provide an hour and a half of entertainment. Well, he had a great arrogance, you know, and, and uh, there are lots of stories about that that I've heard, about how, how he, presumably, he once told um, Clive Brook that uh, you have to make people hate you to get ahead, and um, all that sort of thing, and, and uh, he, he was a very arrogant man. I just, I think that was his persona, and that was the way he somehow he felt that he needed to be to intimidate people to get them to do what he wanted them to do. It was like a, a circus um, a ringmaster type of attitude. And Joe, uh, being a very vulnerable man, being a very sensitive man, being a man easily hurt, uh, and always at odds with the heads of the studio, was not recognized as a genius. And the more Dietrich fame took over, the more he became the discoverer of Dietrich, the Svengali of Dietrich, and all this kind of junk, the more he had to prove that he was more than just that. And then you couple this with the fact that my mother abused the love he had for her, that he gave her, as she did with all her loves, and the dressing room door was locked very often, which always indicated that she was having one of her assignations behind the closed door. And as a man who was madly in love with her and had been accepted into her private life as her husband's status, practically, would walk by that locked door 
I don't think that would make you in a good mood either when you got onto the set, right? If I was to you, Miss Jones, I'd be happy. Wait a minute. Here we are. Thank you, sir. Are these from you? Were you expecting them from anyone else? You embarrass me, Mr. Townsend. You better go now. I have to dress. What are we going to do about tonight? Shall I wait for you after the show? I don't know. I think I'd rather go home alone. Cary Grant said an interesting thing. I said, what was that like making Blonde Venus? He said, well, he said, I didn't have much to do, you know. I just stayed in the background. And uh, I did as I was told and went home. And he said, I knew there was something, you know, between them. I said, well, did, what did Von Sternberg, did he ever direct? He says, a little bit. He says, the first time I walked in, the first day I walked in, he looked at my ear and said, your, ha your hair is parted on the wrong side. So I parted it on the other side, and I kept it that way the rest of my career. The actor's not a creator in films. He, he interprets what is told him. He's shown what to do, and, uh, and his, his uh, responsibility as a human being is precisely in a degree in which he does what the director wants him to do. Because there, there is, of course, only one audience. There's the director. There's no one else. He saw actors, as he says in his book, as bits of color on a palette. I mean, as far as he was concerned, he was painting with these people. But, um, and I, I think he didn't have much patience with uh, their problems in being colors. <laughs> you know, uh, um, I can't imagine it was that much fun to act for him. He was very, very demanding and controlling in terms of the exact appearance and movement of the actors, just in the same way that he would have been controlling of every other element in the set. He felt that they were an important element of the composition. Most directors would generalizing would not see their films even in terms of composition they would see it in terms of the dramatic content the theatrical content as action occurring on a proscenium my father saw it in terms of light come on nobody's going to bite you say who you got in there what are you trying to do frame me Anything that looked right in front of the camera wasn't right for him. It had to have more texture, more shadow, more depth, um, and more character. Scarlet Empress, uh, my father actually composed some of the music for. He composed the uh, music that uh, the violinist is playing around the dining scene. that he composed the music because my father wasn't able to write music was he played it with a comb and a piece of tissue that he was able to make uh, tonal changes with and he sat down with a musician who recorded that and then played that music. He wanted the decadence of the Russian court and uh, everything uh, that could contribute to this feeling of overindulgence, decadence, uh, uh, too much of everything, too many furs, too much satin, too much food, too much this, too much that, too much sex, too much cruelty. Everything had to be excess, excess, excess. The Scarlet Empress was a frustration for him from beginning to end. 